you are one of thousands of people enjoying the content produced by Christ Community Church's C3 Media. First, we want to say thank you and let you know it's our pleasure to serve you. As a nonprofit organization, we are always looking for strategic and financial partners. If you are benefiting from our content, we ask that you consider partnering with us. Even a small donation like $1 per week would go a long way. Also, please make sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Thank you for your continued support, and we know God has a great plan for your life. All right, let's jump into the Word this morning. Let's go to the book of Revelation, chapter 3. In case you don't know, I've been on a series, What Jesus is Speaking to the Church. You could call this a subtitle, The Open Door. Jesus has set some open doors. We had this song we sang last Sunday. I'll remind you. It says that every promise from God, every single promise God makes is yes and amen. amen. So because every promise from God is a yes and amen or so be it, anything you need from God, you can go to him and find his promise. And he's already told you the answer. The answer is yes. However, there are conditions that you have to go through. One is you have to be in faith. You can't just say, well, God, here's your promise. That's it. No, you have to put faith in that promise that God is doing what he says he will do. The second part of it, you can find this in Hebrews. It's like the wings of an airplane. One side of the wing or one side of the airplane, the one wing is faith. The other side is perseverance. Through faith and perseverance. This is going over well. The enthusiasm is so, so much. I tell you what, I feel kind of lonely up here. I feel like I need to get some people, sit some chairs up here so I feel like I'm by myself. But I'm just saying through faith and perseverance is how you inherit his promises. So a lot of us, we have all about jacked up about the faith, but it's the perseverance part. So when the Lord makes a promise to you, or you get a word from God, a rhema word from God. He takes these ancient scriptures and he opens it up and there's a scripture right here. And it's like the Lord says, this is for you. It doesn't mean it's going to be fulfilled in that very second. It could be the Lord says, I'm going to draw you out. It's going to take a little bit of time. Will you trust me? God spoke to Abram. He later became Abraham. He says, you're going to have a son. And the problem was Abraham was quite old when he got that promise. As the years went by, he got older and older. But his wife, Sarah, got more beautiful and more beautiful. How does that work? But he reached a point where it says as he went further away from the time God spoke to him and his journey in life, he went further away from that promise when God spoke. It says he grew stronger in faith. I don't know about you. When God tells me something, it doesn't happen. The further I get away from it, it seems like the more I begin to doubt. And I began to think, I don't know if that's going to happen or not. And then I began to think, well, maybe God didn't tell me at all. Maybe God didn't speak. Maybe I just made it up. So as, as Abraham, our father of the faith, God speaks a promise to you. Maybe you're believing God for your children. Maybe you're believing God for your finances. Maybe you're believing God for your wife. Maybe you're believing God for us, things to change in your life. Maybe it's full of depression, doubt, fear, worry, and you're just believing God to bring changes. Don't give up. Stay in faith. Trust that he'll bring it to pass. Amen. So we're looking at the study of this church of Philadelphia. This is not Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This is Philadelphia, Turkey. And uh, just to give you a quick historical background of the church of Philadelphia, there was a king named Eumenes, who was King Eumenes II, who was around 200 B.C., about 200 years before Jesus came. He was so proud of his younger brother, Adelus II, that he was such a loyal, loyal brother that the king said, I got to do something for him. Well, his younger brother had a name, Philadelphus. And so he says, we're going to make a city, and I'm going to call it Philadelphia, and I'm going to give it to my brother because he's so loyal. So that's how you get the city of brotherly love. King Eumenes II and his brother Adelus II loved each other enough that they had this kinship. And so the city of Philadelphia was set up on a hill overlooking the valley, like in our area, if you were in Pine Grove Mills and you're up on the mountain and looking out over the Happy Valley, that's kind of where the city of Philadelphia was. It was a trade center. They had a lot of arts and crafts. They had a lot of worship going on. There was all sorts of activity, major trade route as people go back and forth from Europe to Asia, etc. They would usually go through the city of Philadelphia. But Jesus, the risen Lord, had a word for that church. 
Would Jesus have a word for Christ's community? What would he say to us in this day and this age? What would he speak to the leaders at Christ Community Church? Well, if you read what he says to Philadelphia, it's one of two churches that don't really get the they don't really get corrected for any shortcomings. At least you don't read it in these pages, these short verses. But let's start. It says, write the following, verse 7, Revelations 3, 7. Write the following to the messenger of the congregation in Philadelphia. For these are the solemn words of the Holy One, the true one, who has David's key, who opens doors that no one can shut, and who closes doors that none can open. He goes on to say, I've known all you've done. Now I, this is Jesus speaking, now I have set before you, everybody say it with me, a wide open door that none can shut. For I know that you possess only a little power, yet you've kept my word and haven't denied my name. Watch how I deal with those in the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews but are not, for they are lying. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and acknowledge how much I've loved you because you have passionately kept my message of perseverance. I will also keep you from the hour of proving or testing that is coming to test every person on earth. But I come swiftly, so cling tightly to what you have so that no one may seize your crown of victory. For the one who is victorious, I will make you to be a pillar in the sanctuary of my God, permanently secure. <laughs> I will write on you the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, descending from my God out of heaven. And I'll write my own name on you. So the one whose heart is open, let him listen carefully to what the Spirit is now saying to all the churches. There's so many things in this verse that I, I was praying. I go, I've read this thing I don't know how many times. I said, God, there is so much here to get out. I don't know if we can get it all out in one service. So I feel like the Lord said, just take one part that you feel like uh, speaking to me that the church needs. And I feel like the Lord just spoke to me. We need open doors just to walk through. You know, a door takes you from one place to the other, correct? How many ever heard the expression doors of opportunity? How many ever heard about like, you know, having a, a, a door that get, kind of just opens up? Like, have you ever saw the game show, Let's Make a Deal? You feel the old school at Monty Hall? And they would have three doors. And by the time now, in the old days, they used to have a, a bonker prize behind one of the doors. And nowadays, they don't want anybody to feel bad. So they have prizes behind all three doors. In case you haven't watched it lately, I'll fill you in. So anyway, <laughs> it's what we do when we preach, right? We just work Sunday morning, so I get lots of time to watch TV. I just, I'm not serious. But anyway, you have, uh, you have this uh, three doors and behind each door, they have a prize. And so you get to select as the contestant what door you want to open. Well, God tells you and I, we don't have to worry about what's behind the door because the door is open. It's an open door. Yeah. But it's an open door to what? Well, listen to this verse. This, is a, this, is, this will help you a little bit. In Luke chapter 11, verse 52, he's speaking to the leaders that are Pharisees and Sadducees of the Jewish culture Jewish religion, he says this, you're nothing but hypocrites, you experts of religion. You take away from others, listen to this, you take away from others the key that opens the door to the house of knowledge. Not only do you lock the door and refuse to enter, but you also do your best to keep others from the truth. So we had given to us this uh, symbol of the key of David, which is what we read about earlier. And I'll show you my gigantic key. But this key... It says for Pennsylvania, look at that. You know what they got? The University of Pennsylvania. No, they meant Penn State. Oh, well, all right. But anyway, it's got State College on one side. This key would represent, it says key to what? The house of knowledge. So let me tell you some things in the scriptures that you may or may not be familiar with. Did you realize that when you give your life to Christ, the Bible says you become a new creation? The Bible says you become a new species of mankind. Yeah. The Bible says that all the things in your past are put behind you because yeah. the blood of Jesus erases, eradicates, yeah. wipes clean every sin, every circumstance, every barrier in your life where you've done wrong things, acted wrong ways, said wrong things, yeah. treated people harshly, 
treated people in wrong ways, it's all washed under the blood of Jesus. You become a new creation. You have what's called a new identity. Your new identity, this key to knowledge, this new identity tells you that you begun, begin to reflect Jesus. That you are a little Christ. That's what the word Christian means. That means you can't gossip anymore about your coworkers. It means that you can't complain about your pastor. It means that you, as a little Christ-like person, have the nature and character of God Almighty living on the inside of you. It also means that you have the authority of Christ. Jesus spoke to storms and they stopped. Jesus prayed for every sick person and they got, that came to him and they got healed. Amen. Jesus had authority to cast out demons. And some of you are looking at me like, what in the world is he? I'm talking about New Testament Christianity. Right. Yeah. We've had for too long American Christianity that is so weak, so tepid, so lacking power that we're just used to, if the pastor just has a great message, we talk about, hey, we had a great time in church. Great messages are wonderful. I love inspired preaching. I listen to guys all the time, and I just think, Jesus, if I could ever speak like them, man, I'd be on cloud nine. <laughs> These guys are just awesome. They're awesome communicators. But the apostles, Paul says, I don't want to know about your words. He says, I want to know about your power. Can you get the demon possessed free? Can you pray for the sick and see an increase of healings as you pray for people? Can you lead others to me, says Jesus? Can you direct people to come to me? I am the door, as he says in John 10. The whole door is Jesus, the door of knowledge. And Jesus told the religious leaders of his day, you've taken the key. He says, not only will you not go in, you've thrown it away so that others have no way to enter. Our job as believers is to go to the key, open the door, let knowledge come into us that we can walk and grow and become everything that Jesus Thanks destined for you to become. Yeah. Amen. You know, I, there's so much that's coming through. I'm trying to just slow down a little bit. The Holy Spirit believes in you more than you believe in yourself. God says, if you go through the book of Ephesus and other places, or the book of Ephesians, he says that his dreams, his thoughts are far greater than anything you can think or imagine. God says, the plans I know I have for you are far greater than your own little mealy-minded plans. You either trust that or you don't. You either decide to embrace it or you don't. You either decide to say, Jesus, you're real, you're my identity, you're my source, you're my life, you're my faith, you're my joy, you're my peace, you're my love, you're my long-suffering, you're my gentleness. Jesus, you're my all in all, and you give yourself to it and say, God, I just want to grow. God, there is so much more that you have for me, but we've taken away the key of David. Wow. What was the key of David? The key of David was worship. The key of David, the Bible says, the end time church will be just like the tabernacle of David. What was the tabernacle of David? It's 24-7 worship. Amen. We ask people, we just ask people, you know, to pray one hour a week. And David said, no, that's not enough. 24-7, seven days a week, we're going for God. Got this little tent set up in the back of my house. And you can go there and you can worship and praise and we're honored. Because the Lord Jehovah, the Lord God is who I serve. It's who I worship. It's who I'm passionate about. And then you just find yourself just going for God. And all of a sudden you realize Jesus, Jesus is more real to you than me standing here behind this table. You realize Jesus has great plans for my life. Jesus has a wonderful future stored for me. I don't care how old you are. I get people telling me this all the time. I had one guy just on a conference call with these intercessors. We pray every week. We get together to pray. This one guy, pastor in Pittsburgh, he just looked at me and says, your best days are in front of you. I'm like, man, I got a lot of mileage behind me too, you know. And the Lord said, your best days are in front of you. And then I could go a step further and just say there was another guy that spoke last May, Dr. Simmons. You remember him, Dr. Brian Simmons? He began to prophesy. He said, you have a voice on Penn State campus. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I don't know about that one. He goes, oh, yeah. He says, you think you're too old and you're gone. But he says, no, the Lord says, I'm going to open some doors for you. 
So if the Lord's going to open doors, let's walk through them. Amen? It's an open door. So let me talk to you just a little bit about the door of opportunity because this is all throughout the scriptures. Look at this verse. In 1 Corinthians 16, 9, it says, There's an amazing door of opportunity standing wide open for me to minister here, even though there are many who oppose and stand against me. You know what happens in the American church? You get a little resistance and they just turn and run. The apostle Paul said, man, this is a great opportunity. Everybody's got, the, I got all this resistance. This is where I'm supposed to be. I've got so many, so many different things I could say, but let me just share with you one thing. We had this past Wednesday, it was Wednesday, wasn't it? It was Wednesday. We had a celebration for the end of Ramadan by the Muslim community. They call it uh, Eid uh, Mubarak. Eid Mubarak. And that means, you know, like we'd say happy birthday in, I guess in Arabic they say it backwards, birthday happy. So Eid Mubarak. We had about between six and 700 Muslims come in to pray and celebrate the end of Ramadan here. I haven't had a lot of criticism, but I've had people raise their eyebrows like, what are you doing? Well, let me explain to you my perception, and it could be totally wrong, and I'm free to correction, but I feel like the Lord spoke to me very clearly. You get water bottles, and as the, as the adults came in, to give them a water bottle and just thank them and welcome them into this place. So we did. Several of us got together. And we're just handing out water bottles to the Muslims. They're dressed in all these different, uh, I mean, there was Western-style dress. There was the people in the burqas. There were people in their, their robes. There were people in the different hats. Uh, all these different languages, all these different cultures, all these different things coming in. They did prayer. They did their worship thing, whatever they did. And then uh, the women and children sat in the back. They got in the bounce houses. They're bouncing around playing couple of the uh, families that we helped from Afghanistan, those guys came in. They came up, gave big hugs. Oh, brother, so good to see you. They were just jumping around. A lot of people saying, what is wrong with you? And I'm here to encourage you. Jesus loves people. And let me just go a step further. He says you're to love your enemies. He says, if you see your enemy, give him a cup of water. Give him food, clothes. Is that not the scriptures? Yeah. All of a sudden, I got real quiet here. Am I on the right team, or am I just, yeah. everybody just kind of walked out and go, we're not going back to that place. Do I endorse the Muslim religion? No. But you know, the Quran speaks more about Jesus than it does the prophet Muhammad. How will these people ever see a Jesus if they never meet a little Christian? How will they ever know? How do you establish a friendship with people who don't believe anything you believe? You have to walk in a higher realm of love. You have to take the key of knowledge and say, Jesus, you love this person more than I do. You died for all people. Or does it say Jesus only died for people who go to church on Sunday mornings? Jesus died for all people. And um, I'll go a step further. I believe the Lord's called us. One of the prophetic words we got last spring was setting up tables for all these different groups in our church to come. Some of you have never been here when we had roller derby night. You, different group of people. That's all I can say. Different group of people show up for roller derby. It'd do some of you some good to get out and rub shoulders with people who aren't like you. Am I meddling too much now? Are we just Christians? We just hang around with each other because we like each other. But you get around with people who don't. Maybe it's part of my evangelistic anointing when I grew up, spiritually speaking, as an evangelist. And to go out on campus and nobody was looking for Jesus. Trust me, nobody was looking for Jesus. And I was there to introduce Jesus to these non-lookers. So you had to go find ways to get their attention. And God has incredible ways of doing that, and that's the adventure, yes. introducing other people to Jesus. Amen. So did I make a wrong decision with the Muslims? Maybe so. I just want to be the one to share with you. So if you hear throughout the community, 
that we were celebrating Ramadan. No, we weren't. The Muslim community was, but we weren't. We were here to bless fellow human beings, to welcome them and to say, you know, I would love to have a prayer meeting. We had 600 people show up to pray. We have prayer meetings and we have maybe a dozen that show up. Let me go a step further. I talked about this at the Wednesday night class. Okay, I'm, lo- I'm losing all my time. What would make a Muslim want to become a Christian? When they say your divorce rate is much higher, we look at the amount of divisions and splits and splinters within your community of faith. We look at all the things that are going on in your community. Friends, let me give you one quick fact. Did you realize the majority of abortions, listen to this, this is, this is shock me, The majority of abortions, 54% of the abortions today are from women who attend church on a regular basis. Over half of the abortions you see being committed are by people who attend church. So if I'm a Muslim and I'm raising my family, why why would I want to be over here with this? Because they believe, uh, you know, people live outside the United States, they believe everybody in America is a Christian. They have this thought. Everybody who goes in America, they're a Christian. We know it's not true, but that's what they see. And they look at our family life. They look at our divorce life. They look at raising our kids. What is the one thing we have that they can never find? And that's Jesus, the Prince of Peace. That's forgiveness of sins. That's the uh, blood of Jesus that comes and cleanses us. That's the only source. And all we're trying to do is to introduce people to Jesus. So we have a church So we have a church that believes that for ourselves, but we don't want to spend the time to introduce others to how they can get free from their sin. And these people are praying five times a day to a God that doesn't hear, a God who's deaf, a God who's blind, a God who doesn't speak. They're going through all this religious motions and they're not getting any satisfaction. It's our role as a community of faith to share Jesus with people. Amen. And we're just going to love people. Has everybody got that? Yeah. That doesn't mean I embrace their culture. It doesn't mean I adopt their lifestyle. It just means we just love people. So if you don't come back to church after day, I get it. But I'm just telling you, we're committed. We're committed to loving our community. Amen. We're committed to finding ways to build bridges so we can talk and share what Jesus has done. Colossians 4, 3, we're almost done. Colossians 4, 3 says this, and please pray for me that God will open a door of opportunity for us to preach the revelation of the mystery of Christ for whose sake I am imprisoned. You know, I had a chance the other night, I went to a social gathering, had a friend that invited us over to watch the uh, last game of the March Madness uh, NCAA tournament. I was sitting across the table talking to all these guys. None of them that I know of ever go to church, so that's why I went, because I wanted to be a witness, just get a chance to talk, share. And uh, I made a comment to this one guy, because the commercial was all about, you know, guys that were going to prison, and they were doing all this stuff, and uh, how they're trying to help prisoners. I said, you know, I just think it's unfair that you have people who've been to jail for years because they get charged for possessing marijuana. And now today, we have dispensaries of marijuana all over our community so people can just get free, free dope. He goes, yeah, man. He goes, man, I smoke weed every day. I thought, yeah. <laughs> Wanted to say me too, but no. I was like, wow. He was just very open about, yeah, yeah. He said, just, you know, get some doctor to tell you you got some type of, you know, phobias or fears or psychosis and they give you a card and you go in and get your, get your drugs and, he was just so open and free and happy about his drugs. And all I, all I can tell you is you, if you honestly think Jesus is the answer, you've got to build a bridge with these guys to help them know they can get free from their drug addiction. They don't have to depend on marijuana. There's a person named Jesus. He will answer you, respond to you, heal you, deliver you, set you free from all your fears. You don't need to smoke dope to feel calm. Go to the Prince of Peace. He'll bring his calmness into you. He can get you free from stuff. I'm just telling you guys, there's just, there's so many things that Jesus has for us to accomplish for him. Remember, we are co-laborers. That means he's partnering with you. 
shared this example earlier, but I'm just going through it again. You know, you may have bought a house and have a yard, but you know if you don't do anything to that yard, you can't blame it on God. It's your responsibility to take care of your yard. So if you're a co-laborer with Christ, he's given us responsibilities. And I can't help but encourage you enough to do this. Let's jump into this uh, last verse. It says, remember to stay alert and hold firmly to all that you believe. Be mighty and full of courage. So let me ask you this. If you go through these verses again, I don't know if you can pull them up on the thing or not, but uh, there are three things that Jesus spoke to the church. He says, number one, he says, I know you possess only a little power. He says, yet, number two, you've kept my word. And three, you haven't denied my name. My question to you is, can you say that you're holding tightly? As it goes on to say, he says, but I come swiftly, so cling tightly to what you have so that no one may seize your crown of victory. Jesus has a desire for every person that's a part of his church. He has a plan. He has a goal. He has a strategy. He's looking for people he can co-labor with. Will you be one of his co-laborers? Will you be willing to take the key that you have as you gain knowledge and understanding in your walk with God, how much he really loves you? Would you be willing to go and to unlock that door of knowledge, open it up, so everyone can follow you as you go in and you're growing in your thoughts and understandings of who Jesus is. So you're growing in your relationship with him. So that your understanding about who he is and what he's doing, it increases. Can you be like your forefather of the faith, Abraham, that as he journeyed with God, he grew stronger and stronger and stronger in his faith? Would you be one of those people? When God speaks a promise to you, we have perseverance to hang on to that promise, cling tightly to that word he's given you, and just to walk with him as you journey through life. Would you be one of those people? Would you be one of those people that would just say, Jesus, you've spoken to me, and if it costs me my life, I will go down believing that what you've told me is true, it's pure, it's honest, and I will stand on your word, and I will cling tightly to these promises you've given me. The Bible says you can lose your crown of victory. The last thing I want to add to this is Jesus says that he's going to write his name upon your life. He's going to write the name of my God, the name of my city, the new Jerusalem. And Jesus says, I'm going to give you my very own identity to those who overcome, to those who have ears to hear what the Lord's saying. So when I thought about this morning, I just felt like the Lord said, cut the message short. I tried. Didn't get there, but I tried. But I felt like the Lord just said about the altar call, there's just several things that he wanted to do with us this morning as a congregation. One is I felt like the Lord said that he wants to open up doors of opportunity for you. It could be ministry, maybe how to share Jesus. It could be in gifts to show Jesus. It could be in counseling where people just sense, they get around you, they just sense Jesus is with you. So you say doors of opportunity. But I believe there are some other doors of opportunity. I felt like the Lord spoke to me, some people here, some business ventures that the Lord has opened for you and he wants you to walk through that door. I feel like there's some uh, relationships that people have kind of put on hold that I believe the Lord's saying he wants you to walk through that door. If the other person is a believer and you're a believer and you feel like this is what the Lord's doing, I would say it's an open door, walk through the door. <laughs> you guys get real serious. This is, this is your life. This is the Lord speaking to you to encourage you to walk with him, obey him, and you're going to see things work out for you. Amen. I feel like the Lord also talked to me about education, doors of opportunity. If you've got the, uh, a chance to educate yourself, go for a degree, go for more training, whatever it may be, the Lord would say walk through that door. That's a door of opportunity. So what I would like to do is, um, well, let me just go through this. The second thing I felt like the Lord spoke to me was that it says he opens doors that no one can close but he closes doors no one can open. Awesome. Why do you need closed doors? I was sitting there, well, why do I need closed doors? He said this, here's what he said. There's a lot of people that had past uh, actions, trauma, condemnation that has come against them. If you think about like abortion, sex sins, uh, people who've stolen stuff, people who've done all kinds of things, uh, 
fear, fear of the dark, failure, lack of trust. All, I could go through their leader, adults, government, all this stuff. God needs to close those doors in your life. So you're no longer under condemnation. In fact, one of the scriptures it says, it's, Jesus said, I'm going to talk to people who are opposing you. They're going to come and bow down at your feet. And they're going to know how much I, Jesus, have loved you. And sometimes he has to close the doors of those guilty voices, those con condemning voices, so that you can be free to know how much God loves you. To know how much he's for you. That you can trust him with your life. The third area that I have is just simply a new name, a new identity. You know, people are so afraid. People are so afraid of being labeled a Jesus freak. Jesus. Some people are so afraid of being called, you know, a fanatic, a religious fanatic. And I can just tell you this right now. Get used to it. When I was a freshman in college, I went to a community college in our hometown. I took my Bible with me, this Bible like this, took it with me to class. Everybody be looking at me like, what's wrong with you? I said, well, the only time I have, because I had to work in the afternoons, the only time I have to read my Bible is over lunch break. So I take my lunch break, read my Bible. Everybody goes, that guy's weird. Well, I can just tell you is the looks you get were really interesting. And you just got to put up with it. You're either going to go for Jesus or you're not. You're either all in or you're not. And I'm saying in the day and age we live now, now, I was a freshman in college a long time ago, okay? So that was a long time ago. Our culture has gotten extremely worse. And God's looking for people he can partner with. People who will stand with him. People who have that new identity. There's also, uh, I feel like the Lord spoke to me, that people are raised in families, that your own family labeled you you're the bad sheep, the black sheep. You're the problem child. All that stuff. God has to give you a new identity. I remember counseling a young man one time who in school, he'd been he'd really messed up and he'd had all the teachers. He just got passed along from grade to grade because nobody wanted to deal with him. But anytime he went to the new grade, all the teachers there were already prepared because they knew he was the problem child. So anything that went wrong in class, who got the blame? Problem child. And he came to me, he says, I'm not doing any of this stuff, but I'm getting blamed. And I said, bro, you need a new identity. We need to break the curse that's been passed down over you from your family, get you free, walk in the identity that Jesus has placed in you, watch the favor of God come upon your life, and things will change, and your teachers will begin to like you and call you and honor you. You can even become a teacher's pet if you let God do what he wants to do in your life. He did, God did, and it worked out well for him. I'm just telling you guys, it's an amazing thing when God changes your identity. And there's other people I believe that God says he wants to do a new lease on life. So why don't we do this? If any of those areas speak to you and you would like for me to pray for you, if you just stand up for a door of opportunity, closed doors, new name, whatever it is, all the things I've said, maybe things I didn't say, but if you would like prayer, I need you to stand up and we're going to pray for you as the music team makes their way forward. Be here on stage. This is between you and the Lord. When the Lord speaks to you, it's a joy. It's not a, it's not a negative. It's not a heartache. It's a joy for Jesus to reveal things to us to set us free or to liberate us or to bring us into new areas, new realms, the key of knowledge. The Bible tells us in Hosea 4, 6, it says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And because of the pressure I feel in the end times, God is raising up people that know how to minister deliverance, people that know how to minister inner healing. People that know how to pray for the sick and get results. People that know how to introduce people to Jesus, lead people to Christ. They've taken the time to train themselves, open the doors, go through the doors. They're willing to spend time with Jesus like, like King David did as worshipers. They're worshiping him, loving him, spending time, realizing that the days are perilous. Realizing that the church at Philadelphia, as you can go through this whole thing, God said at the end, he says, I'm going to make you a pillar 
in the house of my God. Let me tell you why that's important. Turkey's known for earthquakes in the city of Philadelphia. It had a major earthquake in AD 17, destroyed the whole town. They rebuilt it. But for Jesus to come to that church and speak to them, and says, I'm going to make you a pillar in the house of my God. That's security. Everything's shaking around us, but God's given you security. You don't have to be part of the shaken. You can be part of the unshakable kingdom he promises in Hebrews. Amen. So if you guys would do this with me, if you'll stand before the Lord, with, uh, heads bowed, eyes closed, if you would. This is between you and Jesus. And I would simply say, if you got more than one thing, I would just raise my hands. I would begin to raise my hands and say, God, I need, a, I need a closed door. I need an open door. I need a new identity. God, I need healing. There's doors of opportunity. Maybe I've had a little fear holding me back. Maybe I'm looking at opportunities in the wrong way, or maybe I've got things that are holding me from taking advantage of the opportunities you put in front of me. God, I thank you that you're speaking to your church. Lord, I thank you're speaking to us as believers. God, I thank you that you're challenging us to be able to have the keys of David, that you've set an open door before us. You made us that promise. I, Jesus, have set an open door before you. I, Jesus, want you, Christ Community Church, to walk through that open door. Lord, help us walk through that open door. Lord, help us be the church that you can depend on. When you ask us to pray, that God, we're praying. That God, when you ask us to share, we share. When you ask us to feed the, the hungry, we feed the hungry. That God, when you ask us to be, uh, Lord, to be your witness, Lord, let us be your witness. Lord, let us do it with humility and gentleness. Let us do it with kindness. Lord, let us be in a place where that our community realizes that Jesus, you're alive. That Jesus, our life is tied up with you. Lord, we think you've made a promise to us that we're to hold tightly, cling tightly to the truths and the values given to us. Father, please, please let us not slip back. Lord, please uh, let us not go back into what we used to, uh, came out of. Lord, let us grow in our faith. Let us grow in our knowledge. Let us grow in our understanding. Let us grow in spiritual gifts. Father, we pray you'd continue to pour out, pour out, pour out as we're like the first century church between Resurrection Sunday and Pentecost Sunday, that God, that you're wanting to pour out, pour out, pour out. Father, we want to be recipients. So Lord, with hands raised, we're just standing before you saying, Jesus, you can pour out on me. Lord, that the measure I've given to you, that God, you can pour out on me. I accept Lord, by faith, the promises you've made to me. Every promise is yes and amen. Lord, I thank you that we speak to every condemning voice. We speak to every voice from the past. We speak to labels being given to us by our family. We speak to those who are in authority who maybe have said and done things that have created an image in us, a self-image that's not accurate. Father, we break it in Jesus' name. Father, we declare this morning that we have a new identity, that the doors have closed to these things from our past, that, Father, we've been involved in all kinds of activities, but we've been forgiven by the blood of Jesus. We stand before you as people who said we've been set free, we've been liberated, we're no longer condemnation, we're no longer under guilt, we're no longer under fear, but, Father, we're walking in freedom and confidence as sons and daughters of the living God. Father, we thank you now that we're pillars in the house of God. Father, we thank you that we serve a God who's unshakable and his kingdom is unshakable. Father, everything else may shake around us, but we declare that we're pillars in the house of God. Father, we pray that we're not going to be a losing the things you revealed to us. We're holding to them tightly. That, Father, we have a little power. We've had a little perseverance. That, Father, we've not denied your name. So, Lord, therefore, we're expecting your promises to be poured out upon us. Father, we thank you for this in Jesus' name. You can put your hands down. Sometimes I get to pray and forget you cut your hands up. But, Lord, we just thank you. Father, we just thank you. I'll tell you what I'd like for you to do. If you're, if you're here this morning, Jesus said this in John 10. that He said, I am the door. Jesus said, I am the door. I'm just inviting. I think there's several people here. I just encourage you to go through that door. Let Jesus be your door. You just pray a prayer with me as I pray to saying, Lord Jesus, I ask you to be my door. I will walk through that doorway into your house. I'm a guest, turn into a son or a daughter to sit at your table, at that banqueting table, 
with the feast. Lord, you said you've made a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. That's a good word. I'm telling you right now, some of you need to hear this. God, you're making a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You're going to make those of the synagogue of Satan to come and bow down and confess that they're going to say, Jesus must really love you. (laughs) Father, we thank you for the honor. Lord, we just thank you for the favor. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of serving you. Lord, we pray you continue to give us the key of revelation, the key of knowledge. Lord, open up, open up, open up in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Sweet Spirit of the Lord's here this morning. Just enjoy just for a second, just to take a moment. Maybe just thank Jesus that he's heard your prayers. He's seen your labor of faith and love. He's seen your service as you've ministered kindness to others. He's seen all the times you've stepped out and helped others and ministered to others. And he'd just like to say a big thank you to you. But he, Jesus, is willing and honored, if you would, to co-labor with you. He's just saying thank you. Thank you to my bride, to my church. Thank you to those who've not denied my name. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of serving you. Lord, just thank you for the privilege of loving you. In Jesus' name. The Lord's ministered to you this morning. I feel like you've received something from God. Give him a big hand clap. Thank Jesus. Honor Jesus. You are one of thousands of people enjoying the content produced by Christ Community Church's C3 Media. First, we want to say thank you and let you know it's our pleasure to serve you. As a nonprofit organization, we are always looking for strategic and financial partners. If you are benefiting from our content, we ask that you consider partnering with us. Even a small donation like $1 per week go a long way. Also, please make sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Thank you for your continued support, and we know God has a great plan for your life.